If you would remain standing and turn in your Bibles to Psalm 100 as we read our text for this morning, Psalm 100. <clears throat> this is the last in this series of four sermons that we have done over the last four Sundays. <clears throat> Psalm 100, starting in verse 1. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good his steadfast love endures forever, and His faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray. Father, we ask that Your Spirit move upon our hearts this morning, and that Your Spirit would work in us in a mighty and powerful way. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You can all go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> This is the last in this series of sermons called The Prelude to Worship. And I'm going to start off in a little bit different fashion this morning because I, I want to make a connection here. So yeah, if you just hold with me a little bit on this as, as we move along. An unbeliever and a skeptic may read through Psalm 100 verses 1 through 4 and they may look at us and give kind of a casual shrug of the shoulders and maybe roll their eyes a little bit and say whatever or that's fine for you Christians uh, go ahead and make yourselves happy with all that it's, it's all good you know we're okay but when it comes to verse 5 an unbelieving cry would burst forth from their mouth. And it would sound something like this. God is what? That would be their cry. And then it would be followed with, you've got to be kidding me. Then the words would start spewing forth in vehemence against our God. If He is such a good God, if He is such a God of mercy and loving kindness, a God who is faithful to people, why in the world would He allow innocent people to be killed or to be murdered? If He's such a good God, why does he allow disease? Why does he allow sickness? Why does he allow death to still continue? Why the death and the destruction of earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes, etc., etc., etc.? If he is so good, why all the wars? Why was there slavery? Why all the hate in this world? Why the poverty? Why prejudice? And it would just be followed with this continuous, why, 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 why? About everything and anything negative in this world. And really, most of the time, Christians would just sit there with their mouths hanging open, silent. Because that's a hard hard question. And this isn't going to be the main focus today, but, but I do need to touch on it because it has an intimate connection to our text, both consciously and subconsciously. And I'm going to deal with those questions for, for just a moment. But this is going to be short and it's not meant to be anything comprehensive, apologetically, or philosophically, because we would be here for months on this one issue. But I want us to do something real quick. I want us to look at, at some passages of Scripture. And we'll start out in Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 10. And I want you to hear this. I want you to read it. Declaring the end from the beginning... And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish my purpose. That's God talking. His counsel will stand, 
He is going to do whatever His purpose is. Romans 8, 28, we love to quote this one, but we tend to forget the last portion of it. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. But then it says, for those who are called according to His purpose. What's His purpose? And one of those skeptics may look and say, God works out an earthquake for good? Really? Are you stupid? Are you just blind? How about Ephesians 1.11 where it says, In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. It doesn't say, it doesn't say all things good. It doesn't say all things bad either. It just says all things according to His will. And then we have a whole bunch right here in Romans chapter 9, starting in verse, with verses 15 and 16, going on to 18 and then 20 through 23. Verse 15 through 16, for He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on him on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Verse 18, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Verses 20 through 23, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show His wrath and to make known His power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of His glory for vessels of mercy, which He has prepared beforehand for glory? There's our biblical responses to those questions. See, like I said, we're not going to get real philosophical in this. That's how the Bible addresses the question of evil and why does God allow things to happen. And our critics and our skeptics will, will scoff and they'll say very terrible things about our God and end it with, well, well, if that is your God, then I don't want any part of your God. But listen, don't beat yourself up. You have to remember a very particular portion of Scripture when you meet with those skeptics and those critics of God and His will and His goodness. See, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. We can't expect people in this world to understand evil like we do because they just don't see it from that biblical perspective. They don't see it from God's perspective. The reason why we can step back and say, you know what, the tragedies that strike in life, somehow, some way, I can't explain it. God is going to be glorified and it's going to be for all good. And I can't, and again, I can't say anything other than that. But at the same time, I want you to hear it from a little bit different perspective. See, we are what you would call a confessional and creedal church being Reformed Baptists. And I want you to hear what our articles of faith say in the London Baptist Confession of Faith. Talking about this very thing. And it's covered in, God's, in, in chapter 3 of God's decrees and chapter 5 of God's divine providence. Listen to what the, the confession says. God hath decreed in, decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever come to pass, Yet so as thereby as God is neither the author of sin, nor hath fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is the liberty or, or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather is established in which appears his wisdom 
and disposing all things and power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decrees. Things happen because that's the way God wants it done. That's his will. But when we look at under divine providence, it says this, although in relation to foreknowledge and decree of God, the first cause, all things come to pass immutably and infallibly so that there is not anything befalls any by chance or without providence. Yet by the same providence, he ordereth them to fall out according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily, freely, or contingently. God will use other things to work his will out. And that's hard to wrap your brain around. Uh, and I got to tell you, in Reformed theology and Reformed doctrines, I think this is one of the toughest nuts to swallow. That everything that happens is in this world is according to his will for his glory and his purposes. That's, that goes against our grain. Because remember, it's all about us and what we want. But that's not what Scripture tells us. And like I said, I can't explain this any easier and in any easier way than these men right here have done it already. I can't explain it any easier than what Scripture has already explained it. It is one of those things that we must trust in His divine sovereignty daily and ask for faith to live in light of it. That's hard. You know how hard that is right now for those people that are believers in Turkey with 25,000 people dead from an earthquake? That's tough. That's where the rubber meets the road for the believer when trials and tribulations hit. But what does it have to do with our text today? Because when we looked at our text, we're going, and almost we, we look at it and we're going, yay, this is great, man. And now I just took you and I submarined you. What does it have to do with, with, with this text this morning? For the Lord is good, His steadfast love endures forever, and His faithfulness to all generations. What does it have to do with this prelude to worship that we have been talking about? See, to worship God aright, we must know and understand that in everything He does, it is good. It is in love, and it is in all the faithfulness that he has inside of himself. How can we worship him aright while not believing that? His attributes of goodness and love and faithfulness are central to our worship him, worship him as well as all his other attributes. To even remotely think that God is unfair or acts in ill will towards his creation takes away one's ability to truly worship the living God. We can't worship him and not completely and utterly believe that he is good and that he is filled with steadfast love and faithfulness. We can't do it. And that's what these sermon series has been on. The fact that right now, today, we are engaged in a prelude to worship. We're introducing the main theme of that worship that we will conduct into eternity. And if we can't go into eternity believing that God is good all the way, then we can't worship Him at all. This morning, we're going we're to look at three points in our text, and they're all right there for you. His goodness, His love and his faithfulness. So let's start with his, with his goodness. Our text very clearly says, for the Lord is good. And let's just ask the question, okay? We come from different areas in life, different experiences, different circumstances. Sitting here this morning, do you really believe God is good where you're at right now? Do you believe God is good where you were at 10 years ago? Boy, oh boy, that, that's tough sometimes. 
I mean, really, stop and think about it. Is he as good today as he was 10 years ago? What does God is good mean to you on a personal level? Would you say that there are examples of God's goodness that are visible in your life right now? And go ahead, let's just stop and think about it. I want you to wrestle with this the rest of the day. Do you see God's goodness in your life? I'm sitting, and, and listen, I'm sitting here thinking of my own personal life. I'm sitting here looking out at people. I know where you've been. I know you've lost a son. You've battled cancer. You've been sick. You've lost jobs. You've been on drugs. You've been on alcohol. You've been, you, you've been struggling to find work that, that, that pays the bills. Do you believe God's good this morning? That's a tough, tough question. And you may not have really thought of that question in a while, because see, life gets busy, and we focus on the seemingly bigger things of God, not little old goodness. We want to think of the big things of God, His, His omnipotence, and His omniscience, and His wrath, and His love, and His grace. But we kind of take goodness, and we go, well, that's one of those sub-sub ones underneath the big important ones. But it is essential as we play this prelude to worship here and now that we, that we praise His goodness. R.C. Sproul gave a definition of God's goodness. He says, goodness is first a description of God's essential character. It means that the Lord is not evil, that He does not love sin, and indeed cannot even be tempted with evil. Another, another definition is uh, that his goodness points to the perfection of his nature. He doesn't need help in any area. There is no area of him that is deficient or defective, and you can't add anything to him to make him better. So let's pause. We're, we're going to ask a lot of questions this morning. Are you worshiping God's goodness this morning in your life? Do you, tr do, do you and I truly understand the theological implication of that children's song? God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. Do we know His goodness? Do we really know God's goodness? Oh, Christian, we, we, we sing that little chorus, not seeing the profound depths of the goodness of God, not truly grabbing onto it. Is He good? Is He really, really good? His very essence is goodness. He just doesn't show goodness. He is goodness. All goodness. Infinite goodness. And see, Scripture gives, a, gives an affirmation to this. Look at these verses. <clears throat> Exodus thirty three nineteen, 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Boy, we're getting right back to Romans chapter 9 there. How about Psalm 86, 5? For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love. And we're going to get to that one in a minute. To all who call upon you. Psalm 106, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 119, verse 68. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Psalm 145, verse 9. The Lord is good to all, and His mercy over all that He has made. Nahum, 
Chapter 1, verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in Him. Luke 18, verse 19, Jesus nails it. It says, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Or Romans chapter 2, verse 4, or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's goodness is meant to lead you to repentance? Are these testimonies from the counsel of God's Word enough for confirmation for us to know that He is good? Thomas Manton, one of the old Puritans, said this, he said, He is originally good, good of Himself, which nothing else is, for all creatures are good only by participation and communication from God. He is essentially good, not only good, but goodness itself. The creature's good is a superadded quality, and God, it, it is His essence. He is infinitely good. The creature's good is but a drop, but in God there is an infinite ocean or gathering together of good. He is eternally and immutably good, for He cannot be less good than He is, as there can be no addition made to Him, so no subtraction from Him either. I believe God is all good. I'm going to lay my head down tonight. And I say this reverently because you don't know what's going to happen an hour from now. I'm going to lay my head down tonight and either with joy or with tears in my eyes, I'm going to lay my head down tonight believing in faith that God is good in all things. The only way that any of us will make it through this time that we spend traveling on the King's Highway to our eternal home that He has prepared for us. Ask yourself honestly, do I see God's goodness everywhere and in everything? He is all goodness, infinite goodness, and we should praise Him and honor Him and worship Him today for His goodness. Second thing is this, actually wait, I'm not done yet. His goodness is found in everything coming from Him. We tend to see His goodness in the triumphs, in the victories and the joys and celebrations. But His goodness also shines through in trials, and tragedies, and in tribulations. You see it in the lives of people uh, in the Bible, and you see it in, in your own life if you're honest. Just look at creation. His goodness is seen in every little thing. It lacks nothing because of God's goodness. But His goodness is, is really displayed. If we want to see God's goodness really displayed, we see it in the redemption of man. Titus chapter 3 verse 4 says, But when the goodness, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Can you think of any other way that God could have shown His goodness outside of our salvation? That in and of itself is reason to shout from the mountaintops, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And as the prelude to worship begins, will we be able to proclaim from truthful hearts God's goodness in our lives. Will we praise Him and worship Him here and now because He is so good? We need to cry with the old Psalter and say, Praise ye the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks and bless His name. His loving kindness changes not from age to age. 
the same. Now I'm done. Second thing, his love. Our text says his steadfast love endures forever. King James says mercy. Uh, the Hebrew word that's used there can mean mercy or loving kindness, uh, covenant loyalty, or steadfast love. I think you all get the point, right? You, get, you have the right idea. And again, this isn't just how God acts. It is His very essence. It is who He is. He is love. He is mercy. He is loving kindness. He is infinitely all of these things at all times, eternity's past to eternity future. And oh, what comfort that should give the child of God, the comfort that it brings to us. But listen, this means more. <clears throat> I don't mean to get on your crawl here, okay? But this means more than wearing a t-shirt that has John 3.16 on it. It means more than ending all of your conversations with everybody and going, hey, but God loves you. It means a lot more than that. There is a depth and a width and a length and a height to God's love that we will never, never in this lifetime or eternity's future comprehend. And we will never be able to take that love of God and put it into a box and say, this is what, exactly what it is. Because we just can't even comprehend what God's love truly is. It's amazing. It's, it's magnificent. Incomprehensible. But again, that's just me talking. What does Scripture tell us? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God. That comes up with the next one. The faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. Psalm 36, verse 7, How precious is your steadfast love, O God! The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 69, verse 16, Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. See, it's just crossing over all over the place. It's intermingling. Your steadfast love is good according to your abundant mercy. Turn to me. Psalm 117, verse 2. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 63, verse 7. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the Lord, uh, to the house of Israel, that He has granted them according to His compassion, according to His abundance, uh, the abundance of His steadfast love. He's love. Steadfast love. He's mercy. He's all of these things. Do we have hearts intent on worshiping God with a passionate love like He has for us? I asked this question for the last three Sundays. I'm gonna, I can't get away from not asking it this Sunday. Did we come today seeking to show Him our worship, a love from all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our body. Did we come in to this place this morning to meet God and worship Him based on just His magnificent mercy and steadfast love and loving kindness? Were you expecting that when you came in this morning? Were you expecting that as you come in and before you leave that you're going to be able to worship that magnificent, incomprehensible love of God this morning? And just drop to your knees and say, it's your love, O oh God. I come to you, the God of all love, the God who is love. Oh, listen, may this prelude to worship be overflowing with acknowledgement of the Creator's infinite love this morning in our lives as we worship. There in heaven, this infinite fountain of love, 
This eternal three in one is set open without any obstacle to hinder access to it. As it flows forever, there, is this, there, there this glorious God is manifested and shines forth in full glory in beams of love. And there this glorious fountain forever flows forth in streams, yea, in rivers of love and delight. And these rivers swell, as it were, to an ocean of love in which the souls of the ransom may, may bathe with the sweetest enjoyment, uh, <clears throat> uh, with the sweetest enjoyment, and their hearts, as it, as it were, be deluged with love. Jonathan Edwards. May our worship be an infinite fountain of God's praises because of His great, steadfast love and mercy and loving kindness. His love, listen, you all know this, His love is undeserved by us. We did nothing to deserve His love. His love is of grace. By grace we have been saved. His love is sovereign. It is by His own divine choice that He called us to salvation. His love is immutable. It's unchanging. It will never change towards us. If He loves us now, He will love us forever, and that will never change. You can't change His mind for Him. His love is holy, pure, sinless, righteous. His love is eternal, never-ending. His love is, in, is infinite. There is no limit to how much God loves us this morning. And this is not a, a, a grand, uh, and we have to ask the question, is this not a grand and glorious reason to come to Him in this prelude to worship, praising His love? But wait. Wait a second, I'm not done. Should not His love put us to our knees in worship at the foot of Calvary's cross where we see His perfect example of love in the bloody, beaten body of Christ as He hangs dying for the redemption of you and I? His love at the tomb where death seemingly had the victory for that three days. His love there three days later as light burst forth from the tomb and the earth quaked and the stone was rolled away as Christ came forth in triumph alive forever as our King and Lord. Do you see it? Why His love <coughs> is so very important. I know this, this prelude to love prelude uh, of uh, we will take with us into an eternal course of hallelujah for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Christian, offer up your praise this morning, your worship this morning to His great love. Lastly is this, His faithfulness. Our text says, and His faithfulness to all generations. A.W. Pink says, of God's faithfulness, everything about God is great, vast, incomparable. He never forgets, He never fails, never falters, never forfeits His word. To every declaration of promise or prophecy, the Lord has exactly adhered. Every engagement of covenant or threatening, He will make good. God's faithful. And I know sometimes we pause on that one too, just like God's goodness. Has God really been faithful to me? Stop and think back of all those things that have happened over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Has God really been faithful to me? I'm His child. I love Him. But sometimes it just doesn't seem like He's been real faithful to me. We live in a time when the, world, when, the, when the word faithfulness doesn't seem to have a whole lot of meaning 
or significance to many people. For many, faithfulness is no longer a requirement for marriage or friendships or employment, and sadly, not even for church. Fidelity in marriage is optional. Fair-weather friendships are normal. Dedication to hard work, well, that's relative. Regular church attendance, well, that's just asking too much. And that's kind of being legalistic. And you know what I'm saying. Because this is true of many people inside and outside of the church. A faithful man or woman who can find. Yet the Bible gives us dozens of, dozens of examples of faithful men and women. Moses, Joseph, Elijah, Hannah, Ruth, Esther, faithful people of God. But do we regularly acknowledge the faithfulness of God in our worship? Does the prelude to worship in, in which we are engaged in, this, this dance that we are engaged in right now, is it, is it recognized? Can God's faithfulness be recognized by others? His goodness, His mercy, His faithfulness. Does, does, do people see that in our worship? Once again, we go back to Scripture. It's not my words. You all know this verse, Lamentations 3. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Again, one of those ones I didn't realize Amy had picked the song, and I, I'm sitting there, I wrote it, I wrote it down. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we're faithless, and buddy, let me tell you are, we are, 99% of the time. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, speaking of Christ, then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse, the one sitting on it called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. We sang it this morning. Great is thy faithfulness. O God, my father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. And oh, listen, he is ever faithful to us, even though we are ever so unfaithful to him. We are ever so unfaithful in prayer, in Bible reading, in serving, in church attendance, when compared to his uncompromising faithfulness to us. And let me tie all, all three of these things together this morning in, in God's dealing with his people Israel. We see God's goodness, we see God's love, we see God's faithfulness in his keeping his promise to Abraham. We see his goodness and love and faithfulness in his dealing with Joseph. We see his goodness, love, and faithfulness in his servant Moses' life. We see it in his delivering the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt, the Red Sea, and the wilderness. We see it in David's life in dealing with Saul and Goliath and Absalom, and even David dealing with himself. We see God's faithfulness. We see God's faithfulness and goodness and love and Daniel, and Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego. We see it in him bringing Judah and Israel back from their captivity. And oh, when the fullness of time had come, the promised Messiah who would bring salvation to the Jews and the Gentiles alike, we see God's faithfulness, his love, and his goodness. Now you have got to see it. 
in your own life. The fact that we are all here this morning breathing with our hearts beating, you are a testimony of God's goodness, His love, His faithfulness to you. Think of all the years. Think of all the years, all the trials, all the triumphs. Do you see those three things? Goodness, love, and faithfulness. If we were able uh, at, 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 to, to do it at all, to be able to see it from God's perspective, every birth, every death, every marriage, every divorce, every miscarriage, every sunrise, every sunset, every thunderstorm, and every sunny day will be a day for joyful, for a joyful course to be lifted up and worship to God's goodness and love and faithfulness. And people will say, I can't do that. I can't do that when I lost a child. I can't do that in the midst of a divorce. I can't do that for the months and years that I spent battling cancer. I can't do that with my addictions. I can't do that with my lost jobs. I can't do it. I can't see it. And oh God, you've got to. If you want to participate in this prelude to worship, You've got to come to a place where you can worship and praise His goodness in everything in life, His love in everything, His faithfulness in every area of our lives. Now I want us to think back to that series of questions that we asked at the very beginning coming from a, from a skeptic's point of view. The why, 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 if God's so good, why is there this? Why is there that? If we have even remotely to think like that in our prelude to worship, if we even remotely think like that, our prelude to worship to the living God is not honoring or glorifying to Him. In fact, I will be as bold as to say it is sinful. And we're guilty of it. One more time. Let me ask you, what did you think coming through those doors in here today? Where was your heart? Where is your heart right now? See, over the last three Sundays, we've come to understand that in this prelude to worship, we gather joyfully, making a joyful noise to, to, to the Lord. All of us gathering together, and we call others to come in and participate in this joyful gathering. We've come to understand that in this prelude to worship, we are serving faithfully the living God, that we are singing joyfully to Him. In this prelude to worship, we are worshiping the one true God. We are worshiping the one true creator. We are worshiping the one true shepherd that we have. As we come to this prelude of worship that will take us into eternity and, that, and introduce that eternal theme, theme of worship to God, we are a privileged people. Did you remember that when you came in this morning? You came in a child of His. You came in belonging to Him. You weren't just some orphan, some, some, some wayward person coming off the streets, some homeless. You came in as a child of God, privileged to kneel at His throne of grace and worship Him, and worship in the ways that we just described. <clears throat> and you've come to that perfect place, His presence. This building, all this stuff, we, we already talked about the fact, we can, we can go worship in a barn if we want to. It's what we do when we gather as the body of Christ and we come into His presence. And we come gathered for that great purpose, that great purpose, which is worshiping Him. Give thanks 
to him, bless him, enter his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. And as we saw today, we come with a better understanding that we come before a God who is good, a God who is all love, and a God who is faithful to us even when we are not faithful to him. Let's pray. Father, I can't say any other words. My words are gone. The only thing that can speak now is your word. And the only way that it can happen is through your spirit. And I ask that your spirit move upon the hearts of every man, woman, and child here this morning for your honor and for your glory. And I ask this in Christ's name. Amen.